Um, it's kind of, it's weird, that's what I want to really know. You're scared of this, so it's like... I met Buddhism in 2006, uh, in <clears throat> the summer before, uh, in August, I was fighting forest fires, and somebody said, uh, I knew I was going to have that winter off uh, of my job, I worked for the Forest Service, and they said uh, that I should go to India, and that kind of got my, my brain rolling a little bit. And uh, then I decided instead of India, I'd go to Nepal. And I bought a Lonely Planet book. And with inside the Lonely Planet book, a small little paragraph said, if you want to study Tibetan Buddhism, uh, go to Kopan Monastery. There's a one month November course. I think it's, um, it's a beautiful space to, to look inside and to, well, first of all, learn about uh, Buddhist philosophy. And within that frame, look inside and get to know better yourself and understand better your mind. And this is the right, you know, it's, it's a, a really adequate environment because you, and it's very quiet, very peaceful, and you just work in yourself. So it's a beautiful opportunity to do that. I felt this was a way of discovering Buddhism that you couldn't find inside of a book. And that there are some people here that I could meet from all around the world that would really change the way I see things. And I think that's, that's one of the best things a human being can experience is knowing that everything you hold to be true could be dead wrong, you know? I like, I like testing that. I remember when I first came in, we were we were not in the gompa that we're that we're that we we're having the course in today, and I walked in and I was like, "Whoa, what did I walk into?" I kind of wanted to slowly back out of the room, and then we started talking about some of the concepts of correlated to uh, what's termed precious human rebirth in, in Buddhism and, and maybe some other realms that could possibly exist. Yeah. And I felt like raising my hand and saying, uh, excuse me, uh, I signed up for the feel good Buddhism. Uh, I don't know what this is all about, but uh, the cliff notes, please. That's all I want. Um, so I was ready to leave. I mean, it was, it was, it's a bit much to take, take in for a Westerner, I think. Uh, I was coming from a very strict and silent retreat. And, and uh, when I arrived here, everybody was quite talkative. And then I, w I was really, really surprised, and I wasn't sure if, if, if it was all right to socialize or not. But you know, in the end, I ended up socializing, ended up meeting so so many lovely people, and the, just reviewing some of the topics that were going on in the course, and and then and then looking at at uh, how people were relating to those topics that they were learning here for the first time. And, and, and the challenges they were meeting with, the difficulties and the questions they were coming up with. Uh, it was very, very nice to look back and see that I, I was exactly like that in the beginning. I was finding it very difficult to deal with certain concepts.
Kopan Monastery is quite a young monastery, you know, it hasn't existed for so long. It started by two great lamas, Lama Tupten Yeshi and Lama Sopa Rinpoche. The two of them, they met in this refugee camp and Lama Yeshi became the teacher of Lama Sopa Rinpoche. And uh, so they uh, were approached uh, one time by a, a Russian princess that asked them to uh, to start a Dharma center uh, for Westerners to learn the Dharma. And uh, so they took this question to His Holiness the Dalai Lama and he said it was a very good idea. And Lama Sopa Rinpoche thought Nepal would be a good place. Is, is a place for Tibetan monks and, and Nepalese monks in the Sherpa region, in the Mount Everest region, to get uh, both philosophical learnings and also everyday practical education. Um, but then the, af the, the facet of the November course, I think, is absolutely for, for Westerners that may be traveling or Westerners that want to delve into trying to figure out maybe what Tibetan Buddhism is all about. That's what it was geared towards, I, I, I think, I mean, from everybody that I've talked to. Uh, and it started out in 19, I think 1969 and 1970 was the first one, it was in a tent. Before going into Buddhism, I was always, I think I told you guys, I was always like a truth seeker from a very young age. Like I, yeah. I, I, I really wanted to know the truth. And then what came with that, probably through my mother, behavioral and, and maybe what I brought with me, was kind of an altruistic wish to help people. And the way that that kind of uh, manifested in my life was doing habitat restoration for for uh, for the Forest Service and the federal government on, on public lands. Um, but that still wasn't enough. I mean, that clearly wasn't enough. And when I came to the Copan course, I, I realized why. It's because it's, for me, the interaction between humans was, was very important. It was, it was kind of lacking in that way. And what Buddhism gave me is an avenue to pursue all of that, whether it be with, with animals and humans, but to know that at the core of what we want is happiness. And I really reflected on that after my first November course, and it rung true with me. I mean, all of these things that I've been trying to do was to create happiness, and it hadn't been working. And what Rinpoche, Lama Zopa Rinpoche, Kyabjo Lama Zopa Rinpoche really showed me is that the way to get that is to cherish others, is to really look at how you can benefit other sentient beings.
many people are attracted to Buddhism, but they, they really don't know how to lead their minds successfully in the spiritual path, whereas the Lamrim teachings, I think, show that, how you start at the beginning and work your way up steadily and how you need to get the, the basis correct, the initial things, you have to work on them first. And so step by step one can um, expand one's mind, purify one's mind, perfect one's mind step by step, eliminate all the, the negativities from one's mind. So it's a wonderful system, I think. Many people have a wish even if they don't have any religious beliefs, many people like to try and benefit others and they become doctors and nurses and go to third world countries working for poor people, etc. And they go there with, uh, start out with lots of enthusiasm and energy, but sometimes after, you know, after a period of time doing that and giving and giving of themselves, they get overwhelmed by all the suffering, all the problems, and they get burnt out. So what we need to do in order to be able to give to others, we have to work on ourselves as well. And the more we work on ourselves, take care of ourselves properly, then the more we are able, we, we're in a position of strength to be able to give to others. <laughs> Let's consider all these beings together. So there's a front visualization of yourself, your family, your friends, an enemy, and a stranger. Let's consider all these beings. Do this Tonglin practice now with all of these beings, taking their suffering, offering them all your happiness. The more you give it away, the happier you will be. Buddhism teaches many uh, meditation techniques, so you don't, uh, anyone can learn these from the most simple breathing techniques to some of the more uh, complex analytical types of meditation. Anyone can adopt these and use them in their own life. Of course, if one accepts the, the, the fundamentals of Buddhism, they have, can have a much more profound effect. But even if one only thinks of this life or one has a different religious view, still um, various meditation techniques that exist in, in Buddhism can, can be extremely helpful. And, they don't contradict with um, any religious tradition or philosophical tradition. And let's put our family members to our sides. 
our father and the male members of our family on our right, our mother and our female members of our family on our left, seated beside us. Imagine their suffering, all the different ways they suffer, and try as best as you can to generate this wish to free them from their suffering. And do this Tonglen meditation with all of them. As you inhale through your right nostril, taking their suffering that leaves them through their left nostril, goes in to purify, to destroy and eliminate your self-cherishing at your heart. Then you offer them all that happiness and peace out of your left nostril as you exhale. So calm abiding meditation, also known as shine in Tibetan and shamata in Sanskrit, is where you are placing your mind on one object and keeping the mind focused on the object to build concentration. So it's very beneficial on one level as far as just helping us in our present lives as ordinary beings to develop more presence of mind, better concentration, more focus. And then obviously if you can attain, go through the different levels, you can eventually um, be able to apply it to emptiness meditation and realize emptiness, which will cut the source of all your suffering. Buddhism combines a lot of religious, what, what, what are normally seen as religious beliefs and practices with psychology, science and philosophy, investigating the nature of reality because what the fun, one of the fundamental aspects of, of Buddhism is the belief that the way we perceive ourselves and others is the basis of our suffering that the Buddha discovered that the way we perceive ourselves now and conceive that the rest of the world is actually mistaken and that mistaken experience is the basis of suffering. And so we, need, we really need to look into the way things actually exist. The more we focus on the sense of me, which is a false sense, the more we bring suffering to the me that validly exists. Whenever we see someone, um, a stranger, there's always the potential because of our neurotic, self-cherishing mind that when we see a stranger, especially if they look different to, than me, they might have a different uh, <coughs> colour skin, different colour hair, you know, physical appearance, dressed in some way quite different from me, behaving in a different way, all these things that we can get paranoid about, and making this big difference between you know, myself and that person, which can give rise to fear, aversion, and, and all these negative states of mind. <laughs> Professor Jeffrey Hopkins made the point that actually with every stranger we meet, there is something extremely intimate we know about that person that we can connect to. Something very, very intimate that we definitely know about every stranger that we meet, who we ever will meet. And that is that this person wants happiness and doesn't want suffering, just like me. That's really helpful to think about, to investigate, and try to be mindful of in daily life. Especially if we catch the negative judgmental mind arising of jealousy, pride, fear, and so on. Aversion. I'll tell you, it's, it's a lot of fun to come back to these November courses because 
as I've been able to work on my mind more, I'm able to also see other people working on their minds, and it brings me great joy to, to see. I mean, the whole reason why I've taken this path is to try to bring more happiness to both myself, but more importantly, to other people. And I really, 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 really feel from the depths of my heart that's exactly what this path does. And it's like throwing a pebble inside. The Grateful Dead used to sing uh, a song called Ripple, and I think it's one of the most profound songs. Ripple in still water when no pebbles tossed. But anyways, the, the, the concept of that that's kind of has emptiness involved with the ripple effect. But it's like the ripple moves out as you create one one piece of happiness in one person's life, that person interacts with another person, that person interacts with another person. And you've changed kind of that whole perspective, maybe just for a day or an hour, but each one of those interactions is a multiplicity of creating more happiness. Um, and it really, I've definitely seen in my life that it works that way. I mean, just a simple smile to somebody or, or not being as angry in a situation. Now, prostrations uh, looks like and seems like uh, just a physical action, but it's very much a uh, mind training uh, exercise to try to remove one's haughtiness and pride. Because uh, if we have too much pride and haughtiness, it's very difficult to really take in spiritual messages and listen to teachings. <clears throat> because sometimes we always think we know, or even sometimes we think we know better. And then we sort of block ourselves. So these prostrations are done to open one's mind, you know, to open one's mind, open one's heart so that one can um, uh, listen well and retain the teachings and have something to meditate on, you know, for one's meditation practice. So it's done in this way, one tucks the thumbs inside, folds the hand at the heart like a bud, like this, and then one places it here for body, speech here, and mind, and then one places the hands on the floor, and knees on the floor and then touch the forehead. And sometimes one can even stretch out and do long prostrations.
some people see it as religion, and um, but if, if people can see it as just a very profound kind of psychology working with the mind, most people accept all over the world that they've got a mind. So even if one doesn't accept the whole package of Buddhism, um, many aspects of it can be very helpful to people with, um, who already have a, a religious belief or also to those who don't. I have clients with big psychiatric problems, aggressive problems as well, and uh, I've learned to deal with that, but to deal sometimes with uh, colleagues, that's that's different matter, you know? It should be more easy, but for me it's more difficult, so I have to work on that personally. And Buddhists, yeah, can help me with that. Yeah. The reason why you like something that you learn isn't because it's something you never heard before, it's because it resonates with a certain part of you that you know to be true, but no one's ever really put it in words before. No one's ever really showed you a way to let that part of yourself live before. Through Buddhism you can perceive, you can, you can take every um, event or, yeah, every, every event, everything that happens in your life, you can take it as an opportunity to learn, to give, to improve, to reflect. I think I can apply what I learned in several ways. There's a lot more awareness for what is important in life. There's more awareness, for example, on the, for the role of my parents in my life. There's more obvious thank thankfulness for, for them, but also for all the people who have kind of made me the way I am. There's a huge learning about how to deal with my personal anger or impatience. You know, everything you do, uh, you, you do with an awareness of, that, is, that is intent on not causing any hurt, any harm. On the other side, uh, the other side of the coin is, is cultivating an intention to benefit as opposed to just not causing hurt. So cultivating these kinds of mental habits, uh, uh, constantly reminding oneself of that to the point that your, your brain starts to reshape yourself in, in that format. Yeah, I find that very special about Buddhism.
happiness really, the happiness that we're really trying to achieve, every, every sentient being is trying to experience happiness and avoid suffering. The trouble is we don't really know what happiness means and actually the word happiness is maybe not a very good term for what we, we are instinctively trying to experience. And Buddhism says, and, and probably most religions say the same, that we make the mistake of looking for happiness in the external world, but the Buddha and I think most religions say you can't find it there. There's no real ha lasting, lasting happiness in the external world because everything in the external world itself is changing and impermanent and doesn't last. I had gotten some advice from Lama Zopa last year uh, to uh, become a monk. And uh, it was a funny situation. I, I had just entered into a relationship with, with, with a woman. And what I meant to ask Rinpoche, or what I thought I meant to ask Rinpoche was, does Rinpoche, would Lama Zobar Rinpoche think this relationship is beneficial? I mean, does he see any, I mean, because I feel he can advise in any situation. And if there wasn't, then I may have not. I kind of knew with, in my own mind that there probably wasn't much benefit. And then I saw Rinpoche two weeks later, and he came right to me and he said, I talked to Roger. Uh, maybe next year is very good for you to take one of So here we are, the year was ending. Um, it's been kind of a little bit of a roller coaster trying to uh, look at my mind and, and see, um, see how it sits. <laughs> The beds are like um, analytical meditation, standing up, you know, <laughs> because when they debate, uh, the person answering sits down, but the person questioning makes this mudra of clapping like this right in front of their face. And this mudra means that you have to answer what's on the tip of your tongue and I will pull you out of samsara, you know, out of suffering. So that this is that mudra. And um, it's great because it's a very lively debate and they debate everything. Everything in the Buddhist teaching is debated. tracking on exactly what within the FPMT there's jobs so I could go to centers yeah. and work but I'm not comfortable with doing that right because now. you want to do the case I want to do retreat and I also I, I shouldn't be around lay people for a while and you know, beautiful women are still beautiful women <laughs> you know I mean temptation is temptation and it's often what we think of as love is mixed up with what we in Buddhism talk about as afflicted desire or attachment which is really focused on ourselves when we say I love you what we're really saying is I want you to be like you are and stay like that because that makes me happy and while you're making me happy I like you I love you so you have to remain the same so although we 
you know, we say, I love you, and it seems that like the focus is on the other person. In fact, it's all about me. And we want to, I, I, I like you because you make me happy, you make me feel good. So that is not real love at all. That's just a type of neurotic attachment. Whereas real love is about the other person, regardless of how they harm or benefit oneself. And the same with compassion. Compassion is, the, is this state of mind that recognises that either oneself or other people are actually suffering and creating the causes of suffering. So once that recognition arises, then compassion arises, wanting oneself or others not to experience suffering and its causes. Love is expansive. It extends to all beings without exception. So that's really great love, when you can really feel that wanting all these beings without exception to be happy. And it doesn't have anything to do with me. It's about really generating that wish in your heart for them to be happy. Results of it are you, of loving kindness, is that you yourself become very blissful. And a very warm, loving feeling comes from you all the time to other beings. And that's what ends up being reflected back to you from others. So it can be a very blissful state of mind. You know, bodhicitta has to, that's what illuminates the path for me. Um, and this is the ultimate expression, I feel, is, is to take ordination. Because really what that means is, is, is you're trying to give up self-cherishing. You're renouncing the things that we thought was going to bring, bring you happiness when you know after a certain period of time that it won't bring you happiness. basis of fundamental genuine love and compassion one can cultivate even greater st states where there's not just the wish for people to have happiness and its causes not just the wish for people to, to be free of suffering and its causes but great compassion and love are such strong states of mind that one gets involved you know one kind of can't help but getting involved in helping people. Happiness, I, I can't say I really know what happiness is, but um, I would think that blissful experience coming from love and coming from all of the other good qualities that we have in life, 
And when they are fully manifest in us, fully awakened, we can experience an incredibly pleasurable state of mind. And um, I would say it's also about finding meaning in life. And when you feel that you found meaning in life, and you're really living that every day, you feel um, not only when you go to sleep at night, but there's a sense that you're in the right space, you're doing exactly what you need to do to be of help to others. And it lends this very blissful, pleasant experience that you have. If we cherish one person, we have some happiness. If we cherish two, more happiness. If we cherish three people, lots of happiness. If we cherish thousands of sentient beings, even more happiness. If we cherish all sentient beings, then immeasurable happiness. Thank you.